Great. My name is Thomas Bespel. I am the resident writing consultant at the CBS Library. And this is a uh, one of those sessions that's a little different in the Craft of Research series from um, many of the others. Most of them have been focusing on uh, the overall structure of a research paper. And then of course, on the individual parts of the research paper. And then there are some of the talks that are slightly of a slightly more general kind. One of them was on reviewing the literature and one of them was on uh, how to write how to write as such, so how to write paragraphs, basically. Uh, this one is going to be how to manage your time, and it will refer very much back to the talk on how to write, because I'm going to, in a certain sense, be assuming that you are writing your research projects one paragraph at a time, that you're conceiving of it as how are we going to get paragraphs about things we know, uh, composed and written so that our project can be submitted on time, right? That's the, that's the idea. And the general situation I imagine you being in when you really are thinking about how to finish your research project is you're in the last four weeks. Uh, the reason to think about the last four weeks um, is that it gives you a very nice finite frame. You, at that point, you have a limited amount of time. There's definitely a deadline. So if you think about the last four weeks and say, what am I going to spend that time doing? Uh, then you have a really good kind of grasp on the, on the situation. You also know where you want to be going into those four weeks. And so, you know, when those four weeks start, you know, where you want to be. Um, and in most cases, I would suggest you want to, I mean, maybe you've made a decision about this that isn't the same as the one I would suggest, but probably you want to make sure your data collection at this point is definitely a finished thing. You don't want to be open to new data in the last four weeks of most research projects. At that point, you've probably got a, an analysis task that you, if you were still finishing that, that's what you want to finish. Um, a lot of other things like reading theory, um, analyzing data, but certainly reading theory, reviewing the literature, finding literature and this kind of thing. You, you also probably want to have either completed or a very good plan for what are the things we have to find to read? Uh, what do we need to get out of them? Why are we complicating our lives at this late stage with more information of a literary kind, right? Um, and mainly, I would think what you want to be doing is spending most of your time uh, writing or planning your writing or revising, thinking about your thinking about the structure of the of the project. you're You're dealing with intellectual issues at this point, not empirical ones, right is the is the idea. Um, and of course, this is all within reason. So you can be talking to your supervisors and your supervisors have acknowledged that there are some very important interviews you've got lined up. They're going to give you some very important information. It happens to fall in the last four weeks. Okay, so how are you going to plan your project so that you are sensitive to empirical input, but it's not possible to throw you off your game by telling you something in the interview. Right, so your analysis is robust enough at this point that it can absorb new information, but it so it's sensitive, empirically sensitive, but it's not vulnerable to you thinking, oh, now I have to rethink my entire project because you've only got four weeks left. Right, so you want to make sure that your your frame is pretty stable at this point. Right, and that's kind of what I want to talk to you about how to do in some, as always, hopefully very simple and easy and uh, simple concrete ways. And I have a metaphor that is not an iceberg this time. So I have a, a metaphor for this that is not an iceberg. Uh, it's close to an iceberg. Um, here's what I want you to think about. Stole this from the uh, cafeteria. Cafeteria tray, right? It is, uh, it seems like it's a flat surface, right? But it is actually a three-dimensional volume, right? It can contain things. And uh, to demonstrate that it can contain something, I'm going to, I'm actually going to make a mess. So I've got a, uh, got the, this is a, a, another volume, and I'll talk a little more about it in a moment. But I'm just going to show you that like we can pour water into this volume here. 
and I'm not even doing this very carefully, right? And so I'm going to take all of the water I've just poured into this unit, right? And I'm going to pour it into onto the tray. And um, I'm not going to, you know, make too big of a deal of this, but if you were to come down here and have a look, you would see uh, that the and I should I should use the camera for something, but let's not worry about that. We, there's a tray down here, trust me, and there's water in the tray. Um, and the uh, water does not occupy the entire volume of the tray. In fact, there's dry space over here on the tray. It's it's more of a puddle on the tray. Right. Now, here's what I want you to imagine. Uh, we're going to take the uh, the this ice cube tray, and it's a, just an ordinary tray of plastic tray of ice cubes. Uh, so it connects to the iceberg in a kind of in a way, right? uh, because you could make an iceberg out of sufficiently many ice cubes if you had them. Um, we're going to imagine filling this again with water, uh, and I think I'm just going to imagine it because I don't. Know, I'm already making big enough a mess, so. Uh, so we'll just pour, like imagine just pouring uh, the water into this ice cube tray. And then imagine if I put the two items down here in front of me, and I invited some of you down, two of you down, and I said, uh, we're going to have a little competition. We're going to have a little race, right? And both of these, we have, they have the same amount of water in them, right? Now, the tray by volume is much bigger. There's much more room for the water in this tray than there is. This one's going to be totally full. Right, so the iceberg tray is totally full, and the the uh, the cafeteria tray is only partially full. But what we're going to do is we're going to give you the task of carrying this thing all the way around up to the back of the lecture hall, and the other way. And the other person is going to take the other item all the way around to the back of the lecture hall, and back down here again. And when you get to the back, you're allowed even to interfere with each other. Uh, you're not allowed to touch each other, but you can get in each other's way. Right, um, and it's a race. Who gets down? Who gets back down here first without spilling any water? Right? That's the that's the game. A pretty simple competition. Uh, and of course, uh, the question then is: if you're the first to choose which object you get to carry, and there's a significant prize at the end, which manner of transportation would you prefer? Would you prefer? the ice cube tray, or would you prefer, and I'm gonna to try to lift this very carefully. Yeah, I think we can already, yeah, no, I'm not even gonna to try to lift it to show you. Uh, and I think at this point, we now already understand that the, uh, the ice cube tray is simply the most, the best way to transport the same amount of water, even though it's in a smaller volume, right? Does that make sense so far? Um, you may already, I may, at this point, I may just be able to say time management. Thank you for tonight. Go home. You understand it. You already get it, right? Uh, but of course, I'm going to try to unpack this uh, a little bit more for you uh, by drawing a picture of it. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to try to show you this. I say, let's say this is the ice cube tray. And I'm gonna exaggerate this a little bit, but let's, oh, sorry, this is the um, the cafeteria tray. So this is the full volume. Uh, and then we're going to just imagine the tray of ice cubes sort of inside that space, much smaller volume. It's a little bit taller, of course, we know that. Uh, but we we've, we've kind of realized we're gonna prefer this way of transporting the the material, then letting that same water slosh all around in this big space out here. Right? We'd, we'd rather have less space because it's going to be more manageable. And then of course, I'm just gonna say, yeah, do the same thing with time. Think of time the same way. You would rather have a little bit of time then have all of this time, right? As long as you can control it, as long as you can control that time, right? Because if you have all this time, you've just got a place where all your activities can slosh around. And now if we think about this uh, as a week, 
it really starts to make sense, right? You've got the five weeks, you've got the weekend, and you've got the evening. Sorry, you've got five days of the week, sorry. You've got the weekend, and you've got the evening. And so what we're going to do is we're going to try to think seriously about your week um, without letting it go into the evenings and without letting it go into the weekends. That's the plan. Uh, so let's try to unpack this a little more. Uh, and I don't like the I don't like the color there. So we're going to be even better. There we go. That's nice. And then we will put in our ice cube tray. So, and then we're going to label this nicely. Monday, Tuesday. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Now, the first question we're going to ask ourselves is how much time do we actually have in a week to work on a research project? realistically, right? Um, there was a very famous study done in the uh, 1980s of academics, and we're talking now about full-time professional academics, right? So professors, faculty members. And they were asked, how much time, uh, how many hours a week do you, um, do you work? And you can imagine what they would say, probably something like 60 hours. In fact, they, when they were polled, they said about 59.5 hours was the average. Uh, amount of time they said they worked. Uh, this is probably true. Uh, but the uh, you know, the man who, who did this study called Robert Boyce um, uh, asked a very important, interesting question. He said, okay, well now, if I give you a, a log book and ask you to write down the actual activities that you, when you're actually engaged in work activities, could you please do that for me for a few weeks? And the same group of people then did that for him. And what did they, uh, how many hours a week on average do you think they logged? This is the same group that on average said they worked 59.5 hours. Oh, that's a bit extreme. Uh, maybe that would go for students. They would say we work 60 hours, right? But, uh, uh, but we will log 10. Uh, it's 29.5 is what the logbook showed, 29.5 hours of, of work. Uh, now, so you, you, the cynical among us would say, oh, so they, they're liars. Our professors are liars about how busy they are. Uh, but that's actually, that's not the best interpretation of it. The best interpretation that I've heard of it is a uh, so writing instructor in New Mexico called uh, Tara Gray. Uh, and she has a very good way of formulating this. She says, what this really shows is that um, writers spend about 30 hours a week uh, working, or sorry, researchers spend about 30 hours a week working and about 30 hours a week worrying about the work. And of course they count the worry as work. And that's kind of fair because what it really is is just being intellectually concerned about the research they're engaged in. Right. Um, so if I was a really hardcore productivity coach consultant, right, I would say we got to convert those 30 hours into productive work. So you're working, you're actually working productively 60 hours. Right. Uh, but I'm not going to do that because that would be just too brutal. Uh, what I'm going to say is those 30 hours of productive work that we have every week, we just want to be aware of them. We want to accept them. We want to do them very deliberately and explicitly. And then we want to spend the other 30 hours relaxing, uh, recreating, regenerating strength, possibly doing what we would call reflecting, right? So going for walks, uh, having nice conversations, not for the purpose of solving any problem, but just kind of having nice conversations. Um, maybe reading good and interesting books peripherally related to our subject. So getting a sense for the language, that kind of thing, right? So we're doing recreational stuff, um, but we're not going to count it among the, uh, the 
the the productive work hours, right? Uh, so that's what I'm going to suggest. We're going to spend. We're going to talk about these five days of the week, and we're going to say, well, let's start at some uh, reasonable hour, like uh, eight. Uh, no, sorry, at like nine. And it doesn't. You know, you can decide exactly when you want to do this, right? Uh, let's take a break at lunch, and then start again at one, and then uh, work for another. Uh, three hours, right? So three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon, evenings off, weekends off, right? For four weeks. And let's ask ourselves if we could get our project done in that time. All right, let's really think seriously about, is this doable? If we thought we would have 60 hours a week, could work all day, really, you know, if we thought that, well, maybe this will work as well. Now, some of you in those last four weeks are busy at work. You also have jobs or you have various other activities you're doing and some, so you can never know. Uh, so maybe even 30 hours is unrealistic and you're gonna have to think seriously about whether or not 30 hours is what you can give yourself. Maybe you've only got 20 hours. Maybe you've only got 15 hours, right? But I'm just gonna work with these 30 hours as a kind of model. Um, one of the things, the first thing you want to do when you have those last four weeks, right? you're going to map out, you're going to make one of these for every one of your four weeks. You're going to just multiply this by four, basically, right? You're just going to say, I want one of these plans times four, right? Um, and you'll notice it's 15 hours in the morning and it's 15 hours in the afternoon. The ideal life for a researcher, I think, and I, I was able to enjoy this ideal life last, not last summer, a couple of summers ago, uh, when I got to take a sabbatical, uh, not really officially, I just got to take some time off, um, and uh, to, to work on some writing and some research that I was doing. Uh, and what I did was I would get up in the morning and I would write for three hours. I actually wrote from eight to 11. Uh, then I took a lunch break. And then I had the afternoon to read, right? And then I was done for the day. Uh, I tried to live by uh, Hemingway's uh, very wise words. Uh, I always live a hell of a healthy life for the first five hours of every day. Uh, then, uh -huh. <laughs> you can have fun, you can do whatever you like. Uh, but you try to organize it in such a way, in this case, it was of course six hours of work, right? Uh, but you try to organize in this kind of nice uh, plan. In the morning, you do some writing. And in the evening, or sorry, in the afternoon, you do some what we would call research. Now, in your cases, that could be working on your analysis, right? Uh, running the regression, maybe sometimes that's just some things you have to do, right? Um, if you're working in a group, this is a great time to have your group meetings, right? To discuss things, uh, chalk things through, uh, certainly following up on your reading, uh, taking careful notes, this kind of thing. Uh, definitely a wor worth uh, worth thinking about. So you're going to do that. The other thing, though, you want to do, once you realize you've got four of these at the end of your project, you want to look in your calendar and say, oh, do I really have the morning and the afternoon five days a week? Because maybe you don't. Um, maybe you've got some kind of family engagement. And so you know this afternoon is just completely blown. Maybe it's such the kind of family engagement where... Uh, you also know you should probably take Friday, Friday morning off as well. You may as well plan for it, right? You may as well just put those things in. And there's other kinds of things uh, that you should think about. Um, uh, just mapping in, which you know we 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 could X out, but we're not going to do that. Uh, we're just going to say uh, maybe there's a meeting with a um, uh, with a supervisor, right? Uh, maybe, and this is again where you want to think about. Uh, is this part of your finishing the research project? Like, this is part of your working on the research project, or is this one of those things that are still to do? Like, for example, meetings with supervisors, interviews with somebody, right? So things where you have to go somewhere, you have to go and do this thing with that person. So you're, it's going to be taken out of your, we are working on the project and finishing it time, right? Um, so there's lots of things that you just want to kind of mark, uh, like that. 
And then, of course, you want to decide once you've put that in, you know, you put these extra little activities in that you know are not going to be directly project related. You then want to say, well, there's going to be all this writing time. Right. And there's going to be this research time. And if you can do that, you can make a four week plan that's sort of roughly like that. When are we going to do some writing? When are we going to do some supplementary, some more research to underpin that? Uh, then uh, you're you're in pretty good shape, right? Now, once you've made that plan for four weeks, you'll you might notice something, which is too much of this kind of stuff, too much of this kind of stuff that's not actually finishing the project, just kind of right, and stuff that's just in the way, uh, social activities, um, major surgical work on your teeth or something like, I don't know, whatever you, whatever happens to be bucked in there, right? It's stuff that's going to be in the way uh, of finishing your writing assignment. So um, this is why this is space out here is of some interest to you, right? Because notice you've lost some of the ideal 15 hours of writing and 15 hours of research. Some of it, you can just say, okay, we're going to just accept that loss. We're just going to say, we can make do without it. It's fine that we don't have exactly 15 hours of writing in the last four weeks. It's fine that we don't have exactly 15 hours of research in the last four weeks. We can plan out those activities in such a way that it's going to work. Uh, but some of these items, you are going to say, actually, we, we're going to need to take some time. And the way that I will strongly recommend you do that is you never say, great, we'll just take a Saturday or we'll just take an entire evening. Right? What I really recommend you do is to look at how much time you've lost for whatever reason, right? So let's say this hour here, which might be a meeting with a supervisor, is an hour that we actually would have liked to do some writing. Right? We would have liked to have that hour. Okay, well then maybe we'll just take an hour on Saturday and it's gonna replace that. Right? So we're gonna deliberately make use of time we have in the weekend or in the evenings an hour at a time, at most, we're going to make decisions about whether or not we want to offer that particular hour to whatever it is that was lost here. It's very, very important thing to keep in mind. And it gets even more important when you get out of just this pre-planning stage, right? Because now what we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, we need a little more research time down here, right? We need a little bit of writing maybe two hours on Saturday, all right? I'm deliberately being sketchy about taking away your Sunday now because I want you to have it maybe at least one day off. Um, sometimes that becomes necessary as well, all right? But let's say we're gonna put some uh, research in here and I'm always hesitant about uh, suggesting putting writing in in the afternoons or evenings uh, and what I would often recommend is if you're gonna if you if you find that you need more writing time, right? Notice we had a start time at uh, eight here. I mean that is negotiable. I hope. Right? So maybe we could say, all right. So some days, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have more writing time like that. Right? Um, and certainly on the days when we uh, are starting at eleven anyway, right? So we can maybe just extend or expand our writing time in that way. So just have put in a half hour or an hour just by starting earlier is a good way of, and again, do that in a kind of regular way. Um, this, this begins to cause a problem uh, because it, can, it, it ruins your morning rhythm, right? And it can be very useful for you to just say, okay, we're gonna permanently change this, maybe even Make sure that we end all of these like that. We're going to move everything up to eight o'clock in order to give us the time we need. And then we're going to maintain the sharp edge of our morning's resolve, right? So that every day starts at eight o'clock or 8.30 instead of nine o'clock, giving us that extra time that we need. So we start getting ourselves used to starting at an, an earlier time to recover some of that time. But like I say, this is all still in the planning stage, right? This is all looking ahead, 
you've got four weeks, you're going to draw a picture roughly like this, right? And you're going to go into those four weeks with that in mind. Then, of course, life happens. Um, and life has a funny way of doing things to you so that you thought you would have this full Wednesday here to write, and then something comes up, and suddenly you don't have that Wednesday. When, so it may that may already happen uh, Monday morning. You get the news that this Wednesday is going to be spent doing something you weren't planning to, right? And then you might feel, oh no, things are getting out, I'm losing, things are getting out of hand. This is where a uh, ice cube tray is so much better than a cafeteria tray because if you didn't have this structure here, any kind of disaster that happens, even in the future, is likely just to spread and make you feel like, oh, we're losing control, right? But if you have your nice watertight compartments, you can say, oh yeah, Wednesday morning is ruined. But only Wednesday morning is ruined, right? It may happen in the moment of Wednesday morning, something happens in the, in the home or, in the office or whatever, and now you have to do this, right? But you can immediately measure the damage that's happened to your writing process, right? You can just say, it's those three hours that I lost, right? At, at worst, those four hours. I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and, uh, and then what you do is you contain it, and you try to, you try to say everything else is going to keep working. Everything else is going to keep... I'll, everything, I'll let everything else go according to plan, but we got to find out what we're going to do about those three hours, right? And that's where, you know, I don't like to say it, but that is where maybe some more hours on on uh, on Saturday, maybe Sunday morning is going to need to be sacrificed a little bit to this task. Maybe uh, what you're going to do is you're going to say, that's three hours, one of which I'm going to take here. Uh, I'm going to say Sunday is literally holy. So I'm not going to do Sunday. But I still owe two hours. So they're going to go into some of these, right? So I'm going to put in a couple of writing hours in the coming weeks. I'm going to try to find them somewhere in the coming weeks. Hopefully, the sense you're getting as I'm talking about this is that this is a very finite uh, situation, right? There's a, you can appreciate the finitude of this problem because you've got this, and then you've got another week, and then you've got one more week, and then you've got one more week, and then you're done. So you've got to run the four weeks with this kind of concreteness. You don't want to say, my deadline is four weeks away. I've got lots of time. You want to say, I've got four structured operations to carry out. Um, good. Now, how to make this, to focus on the writing, how to make the writing time work. This is where you already have skills, you already have tools that I want to leverage on your behalf. Um, remember the writing moment we talked about in the first lecture. So now this is a whole week. This is just 27 minutes, right? Uh, three hours consists of, let's say, six of these moments in the, in, as a point of departure. Uh, every moment consists of 27 minutes of work and then a three-minute break. But those 27 minutes have structure as well. There's always the first two minutes and the last five minutes. And in between, there's 20 minutes where you can do something for 10 minutes and for another 10 minutes. All right, so your, your writing time is passing in these structured writing moments, working on your key sentence, writing a bunch of sentences. Uh, this is where like, you actually generate a bunch of sentences, right? Uh, then you compose them into a nice, neat paragraph. You read it out loud, right? So you usually say, pose, write, uh, uh, compose and read and doing a little bit of polishing and editing and then your paragraph is done 
This is how you drafted your original paragraphs if you've been following my instructions very to the letter, right? So if you've really been doing that, you're writing paragraphs 27 minutes at a time. They each say one thing you know. Uh, but now what's going to happen is you're getting close to the end and you want to get, first of all, you want to get the remaining paragraphs done. And you want to uh, make sure you have enough, you can work on enough paragraphs. Um, You've probably already done the math. We did this in the structure session, right? So you've got 50 pages or 100 pages. So you've got 100 paragraphs or two, 200 paragraphs, depending on how many pages you're writing, right? Uh, so you need half hours for every one of those paragraphs that you're going to write. If you've got 200 paragraphs to write, you're going to need 100 hours to do that. But in your last week of writing, or in your last four weeks of writing, you've only got 60 hours, right? So you've got enough time to write 120 paragraphs. Uh, if you're working three hours a day, half an hour per paragraph. And so that begins to feel a little bit uh, like you're not gonna have enough time. So what do you do? You can either decide I'm gonna write more hours. So you can write four hours a day, right? You're gonna write four hours instead of three hours a day. That's usually a bit of a slog. If you're working in a disciplined, very sort of deliberate way on every paragraph, it's gonna be a bit of a slog to write for four hours like that at that intensity. Um, so what I recommend you do is you start thinking in 18 minute paragraphs. You say, look, it doesn't have to be two minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, and five minutes. It could be uh, two minutes, seven minutes, seven minutes, and three minutes. I did different math before. Two minutes, yeah. Two minutes, seven, seven minutes, seven minutes, and three minutes. Uh, and then there's going to be another stage at which you're going to say, look, I'm not writing paragraphs anymore. I'm rewriting them. Uh, so now the paragraphs are actually ones I've already written, and I just want to rewrite them again. In my most hardcore moves, I'd say it, it still becomes a better paragraph if you do all of it again. <laughs> you go through the whole process with a paragraph again, but you're going to be in these last few weeks, you're going to be interested in doing this more efficiently. So one thing you can do is you can say, I'm still going to do this work. All right. Uh, no, I have to check my message, my thing here. Yeah. You're going to do this work. You're going to do 10 minutes. Whoops. You're going to only going to do the composing. You're going to assume that all the writing has been done, right? Uh, and then you're going to give yourself six minutes to do this reading out loud, polishing, and so forth. And you will give yourself two minutes for the posing again. So it's still going to be two, two, 10, and six. So again, you've got 18 minute paragraphs. You've got a two minute break, but you've, com you've compressed this a little bit. Um, the next thing you're then going to do is you're going to say, well, now this next iteration, now we've maybe written it already twice, or we've got some paragraphs that we want to write even faster. We want to do four paragraphs an hour. So what have we got there? We're going to do one minute. Oops, 10 minutes and three minutes. All right. So notice that now our posing thing is getting a little more so the, the part where we reflect on what are we really trying to do with this paragraph is now only going to take a minute. We're then going to compose. We're going to edit it for about 10 minutes. And then, did I say 10 minutes? I was wrong. That's going to be three minutes. So now we're at 14 minutes, 14 minutes plus a one minute break, 15 minute paragraphs. All right? So we've now got uh, four paragraphs an hour. And then we are going to go into really intense mode. The next iteration is where we have six paragraphs an hour at nine minutes. Uh, those, we're, we're not gonna have any of this posing stuff. So that's just now completely finished. All we're going to do is edit for six minutes. I'm not in the wrong place. Edit for six minutes and read out loud, work with it for another three minutes, right? And I think you know where this is going. At some point, you're gonna say, we're gonna give ourselves five minutes per paragraph. Five minutes per paragraph is 12 paragraphs an hour. 
Uh, and I would still say, give yourself a little bit of a break. So we're really talking about four minutes. Right now, the reason I've done it this way is I want to kind of highlight in the right color. I want to try to highlight that the thing that's really happening is your composition, your paragraph composition, right? The time you're spending composing the paragraph is going from 10 minutes at the original first draft stage, continues to be 10 minutes for a while, then it becomes six minutes, then becomes four minutes. But really, this is the This is the thing you want to maintain through your writing process, right? That what you're stripping away is a lot of reading out loud activity and composing it. And this writing, this drafting activity is what you're stripping away from your process. But you're maintaining this idea that you're working in discrete moments on every individual paragraph as you go through it. So what's happening is just getting more and more compressed. And what that means is that these writing times, as the weeks progress, are going to get more and more fine-grained right? Instead of being one, two, three, four, five, six paragraphs, uh, you're going to have in the same amount of time, you're going to have 10 paragraphs to work on. So you're, the, what you're planning, there's whole sections now, but you're still giving yourself a nice orderly process to get through every, one, every half page or so of your writing as you're editing. Right? And you're always giving each, and if you're working in groups, you're giving each other time to edit. Um, and tasks that take discrete amounts of time, and you're only asking yourself to spend those at the end of the day, at the very end of the process, you're only asking yourself to spend four minutes per paragraph as you go through, and you're catching smaller and smaller things. There's much, much less to catch, much fewer things you want to change, and so the paragraph needs less time. Right? Um, that's definitely something you want to do. Um, and... One last thing to keep in mind. Uh, if you think of now the paragraphs not as these moments. Oh, no. If you don't think of the paragraphs as these moments that unfold in time, but you're going to think of them as actual logical kind of structures that appear on the page, uh, then the best way to do that is just to for every paragraph, and I mean, some people just do this physically, they'll just have an index card, right? So for every paragraph, it's gonna have a number, right? Uh, yeah, so we'll call it one, right? And then there's gonna be a key sentence. You know, this is where you say sense making is a retrospective process or the internet has changed the way businesses communicate with their customers. Uh, and then there's going to be whatever it is, 120 words, 140 words, 160 words, five or six or seven or eight or nine sentences here. But they're all going to have a very specific function, right? Uh, you will know in advance that they support, elaborate, or defend that key sentence, right? So the paragraph is going to have this rhetorical function. You can put other information in here, like what sources are you using and so forth? So are you basing it on that kind of thing? Um, but you know that the key sentence is going to be supported, elaborated, or defended by the rest of the paragraph. And now what you're in a position to do is to take this, this number, right? You can just make a list, a numbered list, and we call this your key sentence outline. Most of you will have 70, 80, 90, 100 key sentences. Those are the 70, 80, 90, 100 um, uh, truths that you are presenting, right? Um, and they will be coordinated with a key sentence. So this sentence here is going to be over here, key sentence. Every one of those will ha have a, a card like this, either just in principle, sort of just mentally or physically. You will have actually a card with a little bit of information about every one of your paragraphs. Uh, they can be changed. The order can be changed. Right? The key sentence can be modified. The support elaboration or defense can be changed. Whether or not you're supporting, elaborating, or defended can be changed. Defending can be changed. Right. 
these are all decisions you can make, but the whole point is you have an overview of the work to be done here, right? And that then what I encourage you to do in some of this, in some of this research time is to read through the pages that you have and give each of those key sentences, uh, just outside by the key sentences, give them points. And when you're reading through, always make sure that the first paragraph that you have in your read through gets 50 points. And then give the remaining paragraphs points according to whether or not they are better or worse than that first paragraph. Remember, that doesn't mean that any of them are good or bad. It just means here we have a paragraph that arbitrarily gets 50 points. And then we have and the next paragraph gets, let's say, 70, because it's much more finished, much more uh, complete. The next one gets 30, because it's much less complete, much less finished, needs much more work. And by the end of that read-through, you have a list of 80 or 90 or 100 sentences. They all have points. They're all relative to each other. And that puts you in a position to rank order the importance of rewriting any of those paragraphs and to assign to each of that rewriting task a certain amount of minutes. Is this a 18 minute rewriting problem or is it a full 27 minute rewriting problem, right? Or is it just a four minute? This one just has to be touched up a little bit. This one just has to be fixed a little bit. And that lets you go back into your four week plan and say, when do we have time to do this work? Right? When do we have time to actually do it? And that lets me then finish on a, on a note of try to also accept the imperfections that have to necessarily remain in your work. Just do it deliberately. Because some, some of these things that you discover as you're reading it through, you say, we got to fix this, we got to fix this, we got to fix this. And you say, yeah, okay, we got to fix these things. Uh, but where in our plan are we going to fix it? When, where do we have time to fix it? And at some point you say, a couple of weeks in advance, there is no time to fix it because we still want to have the weekend off, right? Or we at least want to have the, the evenings off, or we at least want to have Sunday morning off. There's got to be, at some point you're going to say, no, it's not, I'm not going to give it my all. I'm not going to give every second of the day up until the end. I'm going to make a reasonable plan. I'm going to put in a reasonable amount of work, right? And that's what I'm going to submit. Otherwise, you're not really finishing. You're just exhausting yourself. You're just running out of time. Right? What you want to do is be actually finishing a plan. You don't want to just be running out of time and then handing it in. That's not deliberate work. Um, a lot of students, unfortunately, end up in that terrible situation where they uh, just always make a mess. Uh, a lot of students uh, end up in that terrible situation where they, um, where they, it's their favorite subject, right? It's the thing you've spent the entire, your entire career uh, so far as students working on. And then the way you do your final assignment is such that you do a brilliant job, you get a great grade, but you work way too hard. And so you end up destroying your love for the subject, right? And tragically, it's now the only thing you're qualified to do, right? And you've, you've qualified yourself to do something you no longer love, right? Because you worked in the wrong way with the, uh, with the final project. Most people who are in that situation would, would get just as good a grade if they worked in a slightly more relaxed fashion, right? With a little more time to enjoy themselves along the way. And in fact, not just time to enjoy themselves outside the work process, but basically just giving themselves the time and the peace they need to enjoy the process itself, right? So you're working in such a way that you don't think the only way I know I did enough work is to be exhausted at the end of the day, right? That's not how you want to do it. You want to end every day knowing you did the work you planned to do, confident that your four-week plan is going to get the job done. And then you do that work with the capacity to make little adjustments along the way. Now that's there's no question about that. So I hope that's uh, I hope that's uh, useful to you. Uh, it's obviously a little bit of uh, warnings and word to the wise. Uh, hopefully, also a concrete tool for just uh, going at it. 
And as usual, we will take a, uh, I don't think we need a big break, do we? We'll just take, we'll just go straight into questions. I'll turn off the camera and uh, we'll talk. Let me just clean up the water mess though.